take it away. Thanks, Lawrence. Yeah, so my talk is going to tell you about a uh, particular innocent time equation that arises in symmetric field theory. Uh, so if you take my title and set zeta equals one, you'll recover the title of a famous set of lectures by Sidney Coleman, where he argued. Uh, so it's about just the general usefulness of instantons in quantum field theory. But uh, my talk is going to be a little less ambitious. I'm just going to tell you about a particular instanton equation and a particular superconductor field theory. But it turns out it'll still have like a nice uh, scope of applicability. So, um, like I said, it's going to be in supersymmetric field theory. So, uh, instantons you know, play a special importance in, in uh, theories with some number of supersymmetries. Uh, one reason being that you know you can take the take supersymmetric theory and topologically twist it often if, if there are enough supersymmetries, and when you do that, actually the only kind of things that matter, it turns out, are the instantons in the in field theory, right? So some standard uh, examples of this phenomena turn out to be, let's say, the two-dimensional A model. So. This is a theory with uh, four supercharges, but you twist with respect to one of them, and the resulting instanton equation that, that's relevant. So, if phi is a map from a Riemann surface to your uh, target space, so x I am going to be taking to be Taylor. Uh, so, let's say phi i phi i bar uh, complex and uh, complex coordinates on the scalar manifold, then and I choose uh, Z to be a complex coordinate on my world sheet. Uh, in the A model, the... I'm oh, sorry, could you write a bit bigger? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is simply the holomorphic map equation. This is the instant time equation for the two-dimensional A model. Um, in a, another uh, place where this happens is, uh, let's say, 40 n equals 2. With uh, the Donaldson Witten twist. Right, so here the relevant instanton equation uh, describes a, a non abelian connection on a four manifold, uh, M4. And the relevant instanton equation is just the self duality equation. So these are two, two well known examples. Um, so I'm going to be just talking about uh, deformation of the first one. So it's going to be in two-dimensional field theory. And essentially what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be deforming things by turning on a superpotential. Um, so let me just quickly derive the instant on equation I'm going to be talking about. Um, so uh, a, rem a reminder on two-dimensional uh, field theory for supercharges. So there's a Kähler potential and there, there's a holomorphic superpotential. Um, By uh, I are just entire superfields. The action is just uh, E2Z, the standard bosonic, and then uh, the integral over full superspace of K plus integral over half the superspace of L. Uh, so the bosonic part of this action is just given by. Killer metric with the standard kinetic terms. Uh, and then there's the complex conjugate of this. Uh, and then there's the superpotential term, which is roughly speaking just uh, some constant here, maybe one, one half or one fourth, I forget, uh, times the derivative of the superpotential. So you can apply the standard bug only trick to this and rewrite this as follows. Um, so you can rewrite this as sum of squares. Uh, plus, so you know, the standard bug only trick, uh, if, let's say you apply it to instant times, there's two signs, plus and minus. But here, because things are complex, there's a phase that you can put zeta, uh, the zeta in the title. Uh, uh, squared 
by squared, I mean uh, the inner product with the metric with respect to the metric plus some leftover stuff. Uh, these are sort of topological terms that I won't uh, I'll suppress in this talk. Uh, so setting the stuff uh, in the in the absolute value to zero gives, gives me the instant time equation. So this is what I'll call zeta. Remember, is an arbitrary phase, and. Uh, this is known as a zeta instant time equation. It's also known as the Witten equation, Witten's del bar equation. So I believe Edward first wrote this down in the late 80s in, in a paper uh, having to do with uh, matrix models, if I remember correctly. Although that's that was in a totally kind of different context, I think. Uh, so so uh, some things about the super potential that I will assume for the next few minutes is, uh, so, well, okay, let me get to that a bit later. Let me get to the assumptions a bit later. First, let me tell you some properties about this uh, instanton equation. Um, so the first property is that this is, this PDE, this is an elliptic PDE. Um, and how you show this is essentially, you know, this is, the from, it's kind of apparent from how I derived it, which is it comes from uh, completing the square of two dimensional action, Euclidean action. Um, and so this is going to help us in some later application. It's a technical point, but it's going to help us in some later applications. Uh, so, and then there's a second property, which is kind of fun, which is so the zeta instanton equation is this is a gradient flow equation. So I'll tell you what that means in a bit. So this is kind of fun to derive. So let me just do it quickly. Uh, so what does it mean for an equation to be a gradient flow equation? Uh, so anytime I have an action, uh, so, so just let, let's just take a Riemannian manifold and I have some action or just a function in this case on this Riemannian manifold, that's real value. <laughs> Uh, the gradient flow equation is just saying that, uh, so it's an equation for a map from the real uh, line, let's say, to x to m, right? So it's an equation for a curve. Um, so the gradient flow equation just says that uh, my derivative, time derivative of this curve parameterized by tau is just, uh, the gradient of my function s. Okay. Um, so uh, the claim is that this two dimensional PDE is a gradient flow equation. So the gradient flow equation always adds a time direction to your differential equation. Uh, so I'm going to have to write a one dimensional action uh, if I want to get a two dimensional PDE as a gradient flow. Um, Okay, so it's actually uh, more instructive to do this when W is zero first. So just deriving the holomorphic map equation as gradient flow. Um, so how do you do that? So I'm gonna have to take an infinite dimensional manifold. Uh, so I take M to be uh, pi space of maps from like a one dimensional manifold parameterized by X to my target space X. This, this is little x. This is big X, the target space. This has a natural metric inherited from, uh, from, from this target space X and the function functional I'm gonna write down. So I will assume that the Taylor form for simplicity has uh, primitive Lubel form. So lambda is something like P to Q. I choose variable coordinates. So then my uh, action is just gonna be the back of uh, the legal form. So in coordinates, this is simply omega a, b, b, 
uh, sorry, uh, lambda a d by a by dx. Yes. Okay. Uh, so now let me write down the gradient flow equation. Um, so in this case, it's just going to be d by a by d tau equals g a b delta s by delta by b. Um, so the variational derivative of this thing is just uh, the symplectic form omega b c uh, d phi c by d x, right? And remember uh, that you know, g and omega uh, contract to give you the complex structure of the target. And so I can sort of rewrite this as d phi a by d x plus j a um, zero. And this is just the holomorphic map equation written in real coordinates, right? Uh, so, and Z is just X plus I tau. So, uh, I got the gradient flow equation as a holomorphic map equation. Uh, uh, sorry, I got the holomorphic map equation as a gradient flow. So now when I turn on the super potential, what can I do? This is a Liouville action. Uh, it just looks like um, P dq by dx, right? Essentially dx. Um, in variable coordinates. So natural thing to do would be to just take uh, this action and deform by uh, appropriate Hamiltonian, right? And the Hamiltonian will, is gonna have to be somehow related to the superpotential. But there's a small tension there. Hamiltonians are real and superpotential is complex. The way I resolve this is I just take some real version of the superpotential. In other words, I just take the real or imaginary part there's a small ambiguity there, but I absorb that ambiguity into a phase. So I just take the real part of a phase times the super potential. So, um, so in order to get the S for the W, I just take phi star lambda minus uh, imaginary part W. Yes. So my Hamiltonian that I'm performing the legal action by is just the imaginary part um, of a phase times W. So now if I vary this, you can just easily check that this equation gets deformed to times a real part actually of the inverse W. And this is just the instantine equation written in real coordinates. Uh, so uh, indeed, the gradient flow equation, uh, the instantine equation uh, here is comes from this uh, gradient flow of this one-dimensional action. Uh, okay. So um, so everything I've told you so far is kind of like you know it also applies to the self-dual equation. Self-duality equation is uh, elliptic and it's also the gradient flow equation for the churn simons. <clears throat> right? So you might think, okay, I'm just telling you standard things about instantons. But then the point is the third property uh, says that, which I'm going to tell you about. So what's the third property? Property three is that. Um, uh, so uh, there are no. So okay, now I need to tell you make, make some assumptions about super. So I'm assuming that this is a massive super potential. So I have a finite number of critical points, and all of them are uh, massive. So the second derivative is non-degenerate at each massive at each critical point. So uh, if W is massive, then then um, let me write a little bigger. So the massive condition is just that D I. DJW is uh, non degenerate for each critical point. So, this is w. so then there are actually, so uh, usually, what, how do you think of an instant time? You think of it as some local disturbance in space time. Um, right, so outside of a certain region, you know, like things settle into a kind of a unique vacuum. Uh, so that's certainly true for self-dual instantons. Um, but the thing is, if you want a solution like this, uh, the only solution uh, with this assumption is that it's a constant solution. So uh, the, the term is the only point-like solutions 
In other words, things that you know outside of a certain uh, that that infinity just settle into a vacuum is the, the constant solution to the vacuum. The only point light solutions are constant maps to vacuum, constant maps to critical points. Phi tau x is phi. constant map to critical point. This property, which I don't really have time to show, I mean, it's, it's not it's not a long, uh, it's kind of an easy proof, but I'll skip it. Uh, is uh, this kind of shows you that okay, this is you know this if there are any non-trivial solutions like this of this equation at all, then they are not going to be like the standard instant property to think about. Okay, so it's worth contemplating uh, what type of things you might get with this. Um, Okay, uh, any questions? Why don't you just absorb zeta into W? Yes, that's a great point. You could. Um, I mean, at this point, there's nothing stopping you from doing that. But uh, uh, yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a total, uh, there's a symmetry. You can just uh, rotate Z and, uh, you know, you can get rid of zeta in that way. But it'll be useful to keep it, uh, keep it around. Uh, you're right. Um, okay. Uh, okay. So now, uh, so okay. So in order to get some intuition for what type of instant time we have, it's going to be useful for me, and also uh, to sort of uh, seg into some uses of it. It's going to be useful for me to uh, go to uh, sort of dimensional reduction of this equation. Uh, by dimensional reduction, I just mean I take time-independent solutions. Uh, so the time-independent instant time equation is just going to be. Uh, so it, that's a so that's something that uh, if you get by throwing away the frame coordinate and just something that uh, is defined on a spatial slice, so it gives you a state in your either classical or quantum over space. Uh, that's known as uh, so. And I got this by applying the BPS trick to the action. The time independent equation uh, is going to be you also get by applying the BPS trick to the energy functional. So those are things that saturate that bound is going to be uh, a soliton, not an instanton. So in general, a soliton is something that's a B minus one dimensional object in the D-dimensional field theory. Um, so in the next few minutes, I'm going to focus on solitons. Uh, so reminder on solitons. So the equation I get by reducing it is just going to be, so I, now I just have something that's dependent on the spatial coordinates and it's just the same equation. Uh, so this I will call uh, zeta soliton equation. Um, so definition, uh, so I want, uh, in order to have my solid to have finite energy, I want it to settle into a vacuum at the infinity of space time. So at minus infinity, I, I approach one vacuum, and at plus infinity, I approach another one. So phi i and phi g are critical points of W. Uh, so this and so any configuration on R uh, is I'm going to call an IJ soliton. And solution, so I want this and to solve the above equation. Star is I will call it IJ soliton. Um, so uh, and again, there's some bad news. However, uh, if I want to solve this equation for arbitrary zeta, there are no solutions. Uh, so if I keep zeta to be generic. There are again no solutions with these boundary conditions, um, and the reason for this is um, some nice. Uh, so it essentially follows from the holomorphicity of W. Um, so a, a generic, an arbitrary holomorphic function on some manifold uh, is so you can compute the gradient flow vector field for that holomorphic function. So it turns out that the gradient flow uh, equation that you write down is identically equivalent to the symplectic. So, uh, so you define the gradient flow with respect to the real part of the function, okay? And it turns out that this is the same as the 
Hamiltonian flow for the imaginary part of that function. Um, so what that means is because you know along flows the Hamiltonian is preserved, is constant. What that means is if I take this solution and go to the W plane. So the W plane, my uh, critical point is going to map to some point, critical value. And so if I keep zeta fixed, the point is that because this is the Hamiltonian flow for imaginary part of zeta w, uh, this is going to project to a straight line in the in the, in the direction uh, alpha, where zeta equals e to the i alpha. Um, and so if you insist on this uh, flow ending on another critical point, you know you can't really do much. This is going to Go to in a particular direction, unless so unless your zeta is chosen so that uh, this can actually end at another critical point, right? So so in IJ soliton, uh, IJ soliton only exists for zeta equals zeta ij, which is the phase of the um, so once you do that, there's no kind of obstruction. And in fact, there's going to be uh, finitely many, uh, typically finitely many instantons that you can actually count, solitons that you can actually count. So, um, you know, uh, these give you, uh, so a particular uh, zeta soliton, zeta ij soliton, gives you a state in the ij sector of your Hilbert space, right? So if you're interested in the spectrum, uh, then these are things that you might want to care about. Uh, so there's a BTS bound, and this energy of an ij soliton is just given by this length. And in general, uh, there's there's an inequality, but for uh, but for things that so satisfy this equation, it's an equality. So the name of the game is to count BPS states, right? Uh, if you've been to enough talks on supersymmetric field theory, you probably heard you know, counting BPS states is what people in this field like to do. So uh, I define mu ij, and that's the standard notation, as uh, so assigned. So it's assigned to count. So each classical soliton is weighed by plus minus one signed count of number of IJ solitons. So in other words, I just take, if, if I'm working at a classical level, I just take this equation, I plug in this particular phase, and I try to see how many solutions there are of this ODE with these boundary conditions, right? Uh, and this is not so hard to compute. It's just solving differential equations. If your superpotential is nice enough, uh, you can actually do this. So, for example, if your W is just a simple, uh, simplest example with uh, more than one vacuum, uh, so that in your phi plane, your critical points are phi equals minus one and phi equals plus one. Then you can show that okay, there is a soliton that kind of just connects them. So in this case, mu one two is just plus or minus one. I haven't told you how to assign signs, so let me just keep the sign arbitrary. Uh, similarly, if you have something with something that blows up at phi goes to zero, my critical points are the same. And there are in fact. There's a puncture here where the potential blows up. There are two solitons. So uh, in this case, mu one two is plus or minus two. So both they're both weighed by the same sign. It turns out. What is your superpotential? Five uh, plus five. Over five plus one over five. Yeah. And show us where the critical points are. So minus one and one. Uh, and then there are two solitons. In this case, both weighed by the same sign. Uh, so. These are, you know, some, even though there's like, you can have a lot of fun with this, you can write down some nice symmetric potential and you can keep the super symmetric indices, you know, the physicist had a lot of fun with this in the early 90s where they discussed uh, 
uh, people like Chikadi, Vapa, Penley, Relegator, uh, they really study these uh, BPS indices. And it's not just some special thing to do to mention, you, you can define supersymmetric BPS counting indices for uh, anytime you have, uh, uh, basically, anytime you have some BPS uh, states, you can find BPS counting. Um, okay, so, so why do we like uh, supersymmetric indices? It's a qualitative, it'll be a familiar reason to people who study uh, BPS indices. So, uh, okay, let's start with just the standard basic example that most people are familiar with is Witten index in a supersymmetric quantum mechanics system, right? Um, so, uh, you can, one of its nicest properties is that it's a kind of a rigid quantity, it doesn't vary. Uh, under small or compact deformations of your theory, completely independent. So you can choose any point you like in your moduli space. And, uh, you know, where there's some, maybe there's some enhanced symmetry or maybe things simplify, some fields maybe are drop out and you can go at that point and compute it and it'll stay, stay the same. Um, the BPS indices, one reason why people like studying them is they are, people expect them to have similar properties. In other words, you might think that because these are something like Witten indices, uh, they are uh, independent of small deformations over here. They do not change. You might think that they don't change the small deformations over here. What do I mean by small deformation? I mean, I take my superpotential, let's say it's phi to the n, right? Um, and I, so uh, let's say I take phi to the n minus phi, Right, it's a massive superpotential, right? And I uh, get get rid of this term and I uh, add like a phi squared term, right? Or I take I keep this term where I just add some constant two, constant three plus some terms, but all, uh, right? And so these things, if you were doing quantum mechanics, right? If this was the potential for a quantum mechanics system, they won't change the Witten index. So uh, in this case, you, you would ask the same question. Okay, does this deformation perturbation by uh, adding by adding lower degree terms to the superpotential does this change my BPS indices, right? And uh, it turns out that there's a surprise, and the surprise is this entire field of wall crossing. Um, so. What is, what is this wall crossing? Uh, at the most basic level, the statement is that uh, BPS indices, collection of BPS indices, mu i j, uh, are not independent of small deformation, of compact or small deformation. And uh, they can somehow jump, right? And this is, this can be demonstrated in a very by a very kind of nice symmetry argument. Uh, so let me just quickly tell you. So I consider two superpotentials. The idea is I consider two superpotentials that have different symmetry groups. Um, I take one, which is W equals. Uh, for there to be wall crossing, your superpotential needs to be in a polynomial superpotential. It needs to be at least quartic. Uh, and I take the second one to be five squared over four uh, minus five squared over two. Right, so clearly this one is related to this one by uh, by a small deformation. Um, and so the point is that this is Z3 symmetric. So I take phi and I rotate by, uh, which the Z3 symmetry permits the vacuum, vacua. Uh, and so this overall, this rotation just rotates the superpotential by a phase, which doesn't really matter. And this is Z2 symmetric. Um, and the crucial point here is that the, um, the energy between, so phi equals minus one and one are super, are critical points of the superpotential, but any soliton between those two critical points will have a vanishing uh, um, energy because 
W of one and W of minus one are the same by the Z2 symmetry. So uh, in this superpotential, there can't be any solitons, uh, non-trivial solitons between those two vacuum. However, in this uh, superpotential, all three vacua are permitted by the symmetry. Um, so uh, this would imply that all three indices in this, if they were equal, uh, just vanish, right? Um, However, that's not the case. You can actually show that there are some solid ponds here, right? So uh, in, in this in this in this Z3 symmetric example. Uh, so there's a contradiction there. Uh, uh, that these two, there must be some some jumping that happens between these two sets of BPS indices, right? Um, and that's known as wall uh, In general, if I have a D-dimensional moduli space of uh, parameters, there are walls uh, in co-dimension one. And if I compare BPS indices across those walls, they are going to be different as is the case in this example, okay? Uh, so let me just quickly tell you what happens in this example. In this example, uh, so in this case, right, mu one, two, mu two, three, mu one, three, are, I have a uh, biplane in which uh, three critical points are located at the roots of unity. And there is a single um, one by one by two by three. Uh, so, and these are, uh, so by Z3 symmetry, I can just take the soliton and rotate it and get another soliton. There's this sort of picture, right? Uh, they're all one up to a sign. Uh, however, uh, if I take some, if I turn on some uh, quartic quadratic term, uh, it turns out that one of them disappeared. So let's say this remains plus or minus one, but mu prime one three just vanishes. So one of the solitons just disappears. Um, in general, you have walls in co-dimension one inside your moduli space. And there's the question you ask is, okay, what happens as I cross a wall of marginal stability to the set of BPS indices, right? And the answer to that question is known as what was answered by Chukadi Bapa in this, night, in this series of papers I was telling you about. So the kind of key point is that um, I again have to go to the W plane where things are kind of nice. Um, so in the W plane, can people see this part? Of the uh, yes. In the W plane, uh, I suppose I, so in general, what happens? I, let's say I take three critical points, arbitrary phi i, phi j, phi k. At a random point in moduli space, generic point in moduli space, I plot these points as critical point. Uh, I plot these points in the W plane, and they're going to form some triangle. So the walls of marginal stability are exactly so. I vary these critical points around. Walls of marginal stability are exactly where this condition that these three points are form a triangle fail, and that uh, they are somehow aligned along a single line. Right, so my walls of marginal stability are where this kind of situation occurs. Right, um, the wall by J. Right, this is a wall, and I want to sort of compare this, compare the BPS spectrum on both sides. So this is one side of the wall, and the other side of the wall, you would kind of cross through this point where uh, things lie along a line, point in my like this. Um, so I remember that I told you that BPS all the time a straight line. So there's a collection of indices. So there are mu ij solitons that map to this straight line. And then there are mu ij solitons that lines. And then I cross the wall and then there are some other set of BPS indices. 
I denote this as prime indices. And the wall crossing formula says that, okay, the, the one, the mu prime ij is actually unchanged. Mu prime jk is actually also unchanged, but mu prime ik jumps. Jumps in this way. So this minus sign happens when I go from the situation on the left to the right, and then there's going to be by consistency a plus sign that goes in the other way. Uh, so in general, there's a minus sign here. Um, so this is, I guess, this part, uh, or maybe the whole thing is just known as the CV Chicago Waffle Wall Crossing Formula. So um, so this is uh, kind of a fun thing that happens in two-dimensional field theory. And it also happens in four-dimensional N equals two field theory. So it's kind of a general phenomena anytime you have a super, super symmetry algebra with some complex central charges. Um, this is just a simplistic thing. Okay. Um, so uh, what does the, any of this have to do with zeta instantons? That's going to be uh, the next part of my talk. Um, so uh, before I move on, uh, if there are any questions that are bothering people, let me know. Okay. Um, okay, so let's bring instant contact in the picture. Um, back to instant. So uh, the, one of the reasons why I discussed the soliton equation is um, it'll give us some insight in what sort of solution you can have of the instanton equation. So the soliton equation was just um, this equation where things are time independent. However, by kind of rotational symmetry, I can just take a soliton. Uh, so, okay. Uh, there's a crucial point, which is an ij soliton only solves the soliton equation for a particular zeta, right? Here, our objective is to solve the instanton equation for a generic zeta. And the way it turns out you do that is I take a phi ij soliton, right? Uh, and the x, and I take the following and I just rotate it in some way. Uh, and so if I chose, if I choose data in an appropriate way, it turns out that that depends on zeta. It turns out that I can actually solve the zeta instant time equation for generic data. As long as you know zeta is not uh, uh, example, uh, IJ, uh, zeta. So uh, what does this mean in picture? Maybe yeah. So, okay, soliton is something that looks like this. Uh, at the ends of infinity, this is the x uh, spatial coordinate. At the ends, uh, I settle into some vacuum, and then there's some transition that happens in between, right? Um, so, if this is just at rest, and I take this picture and go to the x tau plane, right? In the x tau plane, this is just going to look like something that looks like this. Region where this transition happens, and in the regions out at infinity, uh, things settle into a vacuum, right? So, uh, what I've done is I've just rotated this in some way, rotated this picture in some way, so that I, you know, earlier Greg mentioned that a z, the coordinate z, you can use this coordinate z to get rid of zeta. So, um, in other words, the z coordinate and the zeta uh, phase are related. So, all I do is I rotate this. And I could choose, I could choose the rotation in a way that uh, I satisfy the zeta instanton equation. So, where this thing is fixed to be something like the slope zeta times the slope of the critical value, difference in the critical value. 
Yeah, so this, I get, so my, my, the theorem that I stated earlier, that there are no point-like uh, solutions of the instantonic equation. Uh, so there are not point-like, but there are actually solutions that are localized along the lines, uh, just by obtaining zeta, soliton, and rotating it in this way. So there are indeed non-trivial solutions of the zeta instanton equation. Um, this was just to demonstrate that. And in fact, uh, there are very, uh, there's a very nice picture of what kind of zeta instantons you can have. Uh, So, um, uh, so uh, I would like to generalize this picture in some way. Uh, we're, so, uh, and I find it easiest to generalize this picture by again going to the W part. So the theme of this talk is things are nice in the W part. So, uh, suppose I have three vacua by I, by J. Um, so uh, an I-K soliton map to the straight line, right? It's a solution of the I-K soliton equation. And there are some KJ soliton, some J I so the, vertices, the vertices are W I W J. Thank you, thank you. Um, so, uh, because there's this kind of uh, nice property that instantons, solitons are for straight lines, if you want to kind of preserve this ge geometric picture in the W plane, you might kind of contemplate a natural thing. So, and, uh, solitons are one dimensional objects in this two dimensional field theory, therefore, they map, they trace out curves in particular lines in the W plane. Uh, so, if you have a two dimensional object, you might contemplate that, well, okay, it's going to map to some two dimensional thing in the W plane. In this picture, I, uh, it's very, very suggestive that you might want to have a solution of the instanton equation that kind of fills out this, the interior of this thing. Um, and uh, that's exactly the kind of instanton that I will consider. And so what happens in the uh, X tau plane? Connect to four in the X tau plane. Um, what it happens is, so uh, at large, suppose I have a large circle at infinity. So the large circle at infinity is going to have to map to this, uh, this, the boundary of this triangle, right? And the only way that this can happen is if I sort of have a circle and the circle, uh, the solution at large circle at infinity is built from gluing, uh, gluing uh, zeta solitons, so what the appropriate things, right? So this is. Uh, this is going to be IK soliton, going to be KJ soliton. This is going to be go back to I because you're on a circle. This must be the case. And you know, uh, there's going to be some transitions in these regions by using the zeta soliton. And in the middle, there's something that. So uh, if I generalize this picture when you have n vacua, that's actually the kind of uh, uh, zeta instanton that uh, it's one of, the, one of the solutions that a zeta instanton is expected to have. Uh, so uh, more generally, um, more generally. So this is, as you will see, uh, as you kind of see, this is kind of a junction of soliton. Uh, if you were in higher dimensional, or even in this mm -hmm. this dimension, you would call this a domain wall junction. Yes. Uh, normally, an instant is something localizing. Yes. Oh, you, oh, you said there was. You are looking at solutions which are not localized. Well, so my, my, one of the main properties of this instanton equation is that there are no non-trivial localized solutions. But in what sense are they instantons? They... They're just as well. They're they're, uh, they're an instanton in the sense that they. Give you a first order thing that extremizes the action, right? That have a 
field theory. And uh, in, in this case, it's a supersymmetric field theory, and I get some DPS equations and the, the things that preserve some fraction of supersymmetry. Yeah, you know, you get some PDE that does that, right? So, um, in fact, uh, yeah, so that's why I, I continue to call it an instant time. More like a network of domain worlds, or? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. But I mean, you know, it really is an instant time in this case uh, because it's something that is um, by definition, uh, I mean, it's terminology. You can argue about terminology, but at the end of the day, it's something that extremizes the action that is a first order equation and satisfies some number of supercharges. Right? Could, so I, could I suggest something? Supposing, okay, so just, just take the case of uh, uh, two IJ type solitons. Uh, the one two. IJ type soliton in the past and another IJ type soliton in the future. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then um, you would draw that vertical line. It's on the right, on the lower right board. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now just put a, put a little blob in the middle of that line. There you go. Yeah. That's, a, that's the first example of a zeta instant time. Yeah, so it's sort of, it's, Kind of, um, okay, now so now it looks like a Zeta. Now I hope one will agree it's a, it looks like an instant time. Well, I think this is a matter just of definition. That yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I said, it's terminology at the end of the day, but it, it's um, not, doesn't it have infinite action also, right? Uh, it actually does have infinite, infinite action, right? Right, right? Yeah, so normally instant times have. That, that's, you're absolutely right. But okay, what, what is one thing that instant times are famous for? They're famous for tunneling between uh, quantum states. And this is also something that will do that for you. Uh, and in fact, that's probably uh, as I uh, as I'm building towards. That's probably the main point of my talk. Uh, so let's discuss that. So is it in particular also true that if you take a compact Riemann surface, then yeah. there are also no solutions, right? Oh, okay. So on a compact Riemann surface, I've actually never considered that. But uh, I would think that uh, okay. Let me just not make a definite statement, but uh, I can see why there would be certain problems. Actually, it's okay. Uh, and Doros, you can have, a, have that, that one. Uh, so you can stand. <laughs> you have to introduce extra zeta, extra data to put it on a compact Riemann surface. Like you have to introduce a, an extra differential form. Uh, yeah, I mean, no, I haven't, I haven't really thought about that. Uh, yeah, in order to write down the equation, you certainly need a polymorphic one form of the Riemann surface. Uh, but uh, I, it's not something that I have considered. Uh, I can see various issues that might be, that might arise. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, so, um, so this is just the simplest example of a more general kind of instant time that I can find that one said, a network of solid Um So more generally, uh, I have, what do I have? I have, uh, let's say I have N uh, vacua by I1 up to by IN, such that they're critical, uh, values are in convex position. Um, then uh, I can consider uh, zeta uh, instantons that sort of look like this. To three all the way to I n. And there it, you, would, you would expect that um, so, uh, okay. Um, uh, okay, we just boards. Uh, then you expect that okay, there's a well-defined moduli space. And uh, another thing I have to do is I have to choose particular solitons that label the edges. Um, I and I one, right? So the picture again is something like this. So I have a collection of solitons and instantons. Uh, and then I label uh, my edges by particular solitons. And 
there's going to be a moduli space of solutions of the instant on equation. And you expect this moduli space to have uh, a, a canonical sort of compactification. That's a very non trivial claim, and it hasn't been proven mathematically. So if you are a mathematician somehow, it was fine to yourself or herself in, in the audience. It's an interesting problem to think about. Uh, expect that it has a compactification. In other words, what that means is somehow uh, all sort of uh, ways that the inst these instantons can go off to infinity is controlled. Um, so you can control non-compactness in these instantons. And there's a, in particular, if it's zero dimensional, uh, what's the dimension? Oh yeah, so I mean, okay. So, I, so the dimension is related to how you sort of give signs to these solitons. Um, I'm suppressing all of that stuff. So a soliton in particular has an integer, has a fermion number attached to it. Uh, it's typically fractional, uh, but you can take the integer part of it. And it's, this dimension is gonna be expressed as a sum of those integers that you attach to each of the solitons. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's, some, that's a nice index theory, but uh, for me, I'm just gonna be caring about these, the example where you have a zero dimensional modulus space. Then you can define a well defined integer. Uh, by the way, when, I'm, when am I supposed to end? I can. Around 10, 15 minutes. Okay. Uh, thank you. Yeah. This is a Z. Uh, so the, these are integers that, you, that give you a uh, number of instantons with these particular boundary conditions. So if n is 3, these are going to be the number of instantons that fill up this triangle. So uh, how do I, what is this? Uh, so where do we, where would you expect such things to show up? Um, so in fact, they show up in a very natural way. If you ask a question about wall cross. And that's the following question. So let me go back to quantum mechanics again for a second. The Witten index uh, has a more refined uh, counterpart. Uh, it's the trace over the space of ground states weighed by the fermion so, uh, sign given by the fermion number of the states. Now, uh, so this is a, uh, the space of ground states is the more refined object that you want to study, right? So just as the Witten index is protected, the space of ground states is a more refined object that is also protected. Think of harmonic forms on a compact Riemannian manifold, right? The space of harmonic forms is, is a beautiful object that leads to a very nice cohomology theory. You know, you can compute this cohomology in various ways. You know, it leads to a much richer theory than just the other character of the manifold. In a similar way, uh, things that saturate this BPS bound, we have only discussed them at the level of uh, some BPS indices or integers uh, that, uh, so we've only discussed some integers that are assigned to the ID sector. These are things that you really want to care about if you want to learn something non-trivial about field theory. Um, so uh, you might want to refine this. So we consider Rij to be uh, the space of the Hilbert space in the Hilbert subspace where uh, such a bound is saturated. And uh, this is the sort of object that you would want to study, right? So the Witten index is just given by some uh, Euler character of this Hilbert space of ground states. And so any property that these BPS indices satisfy, you would want to kind of refine this property to the vector space of BPS states, right? In particular, the question I'm going to ask is, can I describe how uh, the BPS 
Hilbert spaces jump across a wall of marginal stability, right? EPS indices are not constant as I vary my moduli space, very long my moduli space. Therefore, my VPS Hilbert spaces will also not be uh, constant. Sorry, so the R and J are just the approximate ground states. Those are the semi classical. Oh, I'm talking about the actual quantum over space here. So uh, R and J is the actual space of VPS states, not the ones, the semi classical space states. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, okay, um, you're right. Um, yeah, I mean, let me just take it to be the space of quantum over space. Oops, over. Uh, so that, that's what I'm, you know, that's, so I, I want to phrase my question in a way that, you know, makes it totally manifest that it's a physical question. I'm only asking one question about what happens to the actual, uh, what is the jump across all of our to the actual physical, right? Uh, that's what I want to ask. So this is what I call categorical level crossing. How do the collection of EPS over spaces jump across the wall? So if you're just uh, kind of, if I just take that formula and the very natural way to kind of just sort of categorify it. I'd say that, declare that this is the answer. Right? Or possibly with a degree shift here to account for the minus sign. So minus sign appears in within the indices when you have a fermion degree, odd fermion degree. So you might want to shift the fermion degree here. Minus one. Um, so this is something you might guess, uh, but actually if you try to guess, test this formula across the simplest example of wall crossing, which is W being the quarter superpotential, this actually fails. Um, so remember that in the, in the, in the case of the quartic superpotential at the Z3 symmetric point, therefore, there was a single solid time between each of the three critical points. So if I apply this formula, I would get that, let's say one three is just a one dimensional space plus a one dimensional space in a shifted degree. Um, so you would get something that looks like the cohomology of a circle the cohomology of a circle has vanishing order characteristic, but itself it's non-trivial. There are two states in that cohomology, but uh, we actually showed that it was impossible for you to have a non-trivial solid time, rather, let alone have two of them in the Hilbert space of the one in the, in the sector. Um, when I cross the wall in the sector where the mass of the solid time vanishes. So what we really want is we want to write down a formula such that this is actually uh, the right answer is empty. So not empty, zero vector space. Isn't that only already nonsensical because you can cross back and forth and back and forth as you get the bigger and bigger space? Yeah, and yeah. The actual dimension of the growth. Yeah. Yeah, 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 you're right. Absolutely. That's another way you can see this, right? Uh, that this, a formula like this can't work. Excellent. Yeah. Um, um, so what you want, is, if you're familiar with sort of homological algebra, what you really want is you want a sort of differential that cancels these two vectors, right? The differential can pair up this vector with this vector. Um, and that's, uh, in the construction of this differential is where my instantons is where they show up. Right. Um, Okay, uh, let's see. 
So this is almost the right answer, except you need to equip this space with a differential. And how do I do that? So, um, so I'm going to be interested in this in these integers when n is in the case when n is three. So uh, suppose I have uh, my situation in wall crossing where I have wi, wj, wk, right? Then I can have I can assign some integers uh, in this way. So I label my solid terms i k i. J, sorry, KJ and JI, right? So uh, in the case when this is a zero dimensional moduli space, I can form this vector. Times the uh, corresponding quantum state. Uh, I'll just write this as follows. So there's some, I'm, uh, a little, uh, uh, I'm suppressing a few things over here, but I have to just take up time. So I define this to be, uh, let's say, beta ijk, and this lives beta ikj. This lives in the following vector space. This is an element in the tensor product of the quantum number spaces. Um, okay. So uh, by using the sort of CPT duality between IK and JK solitons, this can be viewed as, so, uh, so I sum, sorry, I sort of summed over all solitons such that this gives you a zero dimensional moduli space. Uh, so I sum over all these states, this gives you some formal vector in this tensor product of Hilbert spaces. Um, so I can use this, I can use the duality between, let's say, kj and jk solitons to actually use this to define a map tijk uh, of degree zero, rij, tensor rjk, rij, okay? So this map is what's going to be uh, added to this. So the upshot of the use of this trivalent instanton, this one particular use is that R prime IK, so the categorical wall crossing formula is that the R prime IK is the cohomology of the complex um, RIK plus RIJ tensor RJK shifted by minus one. And uh, the differential is just going to be in this case, because I'm assuming these are actually quantum over spaces, uh, 0, 0, 0, tij. This is my differential. And I take this, uh, take the cohomology, and my claim is I'll get the right over space. So this is, this is known as the categorical wall crossing formula. Um, and it's, it tells you how the VPS over spaces jump. So another way to write this, if you're familiar with, again, some homological algebra, you would say that R prime IK is how much of the equivalent to the mapping cone of this chain map. Of this map. Um, so this, this formula that incorporates uh, Instantons in the trivalent in the trivalent instantons, the trivalent junctions, allows you to actually answer this formula of how the BPS Hilbert spaces jump across the wall of market stability. And you know, you can prove this. Uh, we do it in, in, in our paper from last year, uh, and you can extend it to different situations where you know you have twisted masses. You can think about four-dimensional case. Um, and so that's work in progress. So uh, this is the so okay. Finally, uh, I'll just say the following. I'll just indicate the picture that you might remember. Um, uh, so what I've actually done can be summarized in one way. Uh, so I've taken this picture. Uh, in this picture, the uh, vertices label states that preserve all four supercharges, their vacua. 
edges. I have now upgraded down to Hilbert spaces. These Hilbert spaces preserve half of the supersymmetry. Um, but then I also filled in this uh, interior. This interior is filled by uh, states that preserve one quarter of the supersymmetry. So this is filled by this element, beta i k k. And what I've done is I've taken this picture and I've sort of just filled, in, filled it in on both sides. That's all the categorical wall crafting is. In other words, I'm telling you that I also I can also determine uh, something about instant bounds by no it on either side. And now this stuff, this data, this uh, this half VPS solitons and quarter VPS instant tons get yeah, mixed up across all the markers. So that's the punchline as far as categorical wall crossing goes. That's one use of a zeta instant ton. Um, so I'm probably over time, but I wanted to tell you a few other contexts in which zeta instant tons are useful. And I will let Lorenz decide if that's worth it or if we can, uh, that can be uh, left to the questions if people want to know about that. Maybe it's like five minutes. Now. Okay. Yeah. How about Oh, five minutes. I have a question. Yes. question. So, can you can can you view these uh, instantons as giving you the tunneling amplitude between two solitons going to a third? So some Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So this is. I mean, that's what I've said is that's that is actually this is an equivalent way of saying the same thing. So there are some complexes. There is some VPS. There's a tensor product. There's a two product. Uh, there's a bound state of solitons at past infinity, and there's a single soliton at Plus infinity and this instanton, this trial instanton, is providing you a tunneling between that. And because your 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 instantons look like scattering amplitude. Absolutely, absolutely. So there is a connection with some kind of scattering amplitude. There is, but you know we haven't. I mean, um, it's an interesting direction to actually make precise what is the relation to actual. You know, how do how do these uh, question? I mean, do these integers actually show up in some scattering amplitude of VPS states? I, I don't know, but it's a natural thing to. To ask here, they're just viewed as some tunneling amplitudes. So that's another way that these are actually these things actually do behave like uh, traditional instant time. They provide you tunneling between different quantum states. In this case, the space, the the, the uh, tunneling it provides you between is solitonic states, so, uh, VPS states in soliton sectors. So Lauren, you said that now. You want this? Yeah, just just. Uh, I'll be very good. Uh, so I want. I just want to tell you more than one use. <laughs> okay. Uh, so. Um, okay, so I will just try to stay this stay one in one, uh, and I'll tell you words. Uh, so, um some of the most uh, this, you know, this you might get the impression that this is something I only care about if I interested in two-dimensional field theory, um, this instanton equation. Well, there are two answers to this. One is that you can actually ask the exact same question in, wall, in situations where wall crossing occurs in other dimensions, so 40 n equals two. Uh, you, you might want to ask, what is the analog of zeta instanton that provides you tunneling between tunneling leading to wall crossing in 40 n equals two? Um, that's not, you know, you can, that's a very exciting question. Uh, I want to work on this, uh, but uh, it's not the direction in which I will provide other uses. Uh, another uh, use where zeta and equation is useful is if you actually go to infinite dimensions. In other words, if you take W, the superpotential, to be a holomorphic functional on some space of field. Okay, so there are three examples. So, um, uh, like I said, I'm just going to restrict to names here. Um, so, uh, W is the holomorphic dual functional. functional. So if I have some uh, complex symplectic manifold, uh, I can take, uh, so I let Y be some complex symplectic manifold, then I let this thing be trivialized. I can consider the following holomorphic superposition, infinite dimensional. Right, so this is a holomorphic thing because my selected form is holomorphic. And I can ask what are the corresponding soliton and instanton equations. 
Um, the soliton equation here is just a uh, holomorphic map equation and some appropriate complex structure. So remember this, so I'm writing this in, uh, in I'm, I'm introducing an additional coordinate here. Y coordinate. And the instanton equation is a three dimensional instanton equation that I haven't seen actually in literature, but let's write it. So JAB is the actual complex structure on my complex eclectic manifold. And IAB is another one, zeta dependent one, that's different. This is a three-dimensional instanton equation. I believe this is the instanton equation for rosansky witten theory in three dimensions. But uh, you know, this is the Lubo functional that Edward used with uh, Buko uh, to do brain quantization. So I wonder if there's any way you can use this three-dimensional equation to say something about that. I don't know. Uh, so that's one example in dimensions. Another is that if I take W to be the churn sign of superposition. So this leads to the four-dimensional and five-dimensional equations. Um, those are known as the Poussin Witten equations and the Hayes Witten equations. And Edward used that to, uh, with an appropriate boundary condition, to give, tell you how to you know, the physical construction of Coven homology. And finally, I, again, this is, I don't know any discussion of this in the literature. If I take W to be the 4D turn Simon superpotential, right, I will get some four, uh, five and six dimensional equations. Which I really don't know uh, how you can use them. You know, 40, uh, the 40 churn Simons was used by Costello to uh, compute things about n equals one supersymmetric gauge theory and in relation to integral systems. So using these soliton and instanton equations applied to this four dimensional churn Simons functional might lead to something interesting. I don't know. Uh, so thank you for your attention. Have more questions. Yes, super naive, but uh, I guess there was work by Dimitri Galakov for relating Shvansky uh, written uh, homology to make kind of the same story you're talking about here, like mm -hmm. uh, Lando Ginsburg ground states homology of the Hilbert space of ground state. Are you Is talking about related at all? To, to, are you talking about the paper of Greg Moore and Dima Gala? Uh, more recent, just the solo paper. Oh, okay, uh, okay. Like, yeah, I, I, I've known that it's something about it. this one. I mean, I didn't, I don't remember seeing any use of Rosansky Witten data here, but uh, it's true that he does talk about the Zeta instanton equation in that paper. Um, yeah. Uh, but I mean, yeah, so. Uh, one thing you can do is you can take this description of not homology and sort of do sort of try to reduce this into a lower dimensional picture and uh, lead to some computable version of not homology. And you know that's I believe Greg has worked on that. Dima Gautam has worked on that. Edward and Dev have worked on that. Um, yeah, so on this entire picture on land of Innsbruck models is quite useful in that entire context. The, the way you construct the French is again is by considering zeta syntax. In those models with those super potentials. Yep. I have a super basic question I should ask earlier. And these like junctiony pictures, yeah. are, the, are the angles fixed? Yes, they are. So, so the tensions have got to balance. The Absolutely. They really look more like wall junctions than particle scattering. Um, scattering of the angles would not be fixed. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you're absolutely right. So these it looks like the main wall tension. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the angles between those uh, between an IJ soliton is exactly fixed by supersymmetry. So you can't really. Uh, you're right. I mean, yeah, you have, might have some problem if you want to relate this to amplitudes, uh, because in that case the angles would be anything. So, so it's balancing tensions. I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. So tensions are balanced in this case. You're right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mentioned that in a small corner on the board that the tension, the angle is fixed. Uh, if you want to preserve it, yeah, that's why that's why zeta is uh, yeah mm -hmm. yeah. Well, but that that could look like a, like an amplitude of massive particles in Euclidean space or so below threshold. 
Yeah. So I mean, if, if I expect if there's any relation to amplitudes, I expect that it will just be in the BPS sector. So it'll be some amplitude of BPS particles to scatter into other BPS particles, uh, some reduced amplitude. Um, yeah. Uh, I expect that, you know, again, this kind of question was considered in uh, early 90s papers by Chakati, Baba, Fendry, and Fendley and Trillier. They actually did some, uh, compute, compute some scattering amplitudes. So it'd be nice to go back to those papers and see if somehow you can compute uh, so they did an infrared expansion in their in their uh, in the in a quantity, and they showed that the uh, the lowest degree lowest order term exactly is related to mu i j, and the second lowest degree is related to two particle contributions. So it's very natural to to maybe think that these integers that count instantons somehow are actually you know uh, hidden in their formula somewhere. Uh, yeah. All right, let's uh, thank Asan again.